reaches out. Uh, so welcome to our ninth uh, workshop series um, on the resiliency dialogues on where we explore the impact of COVID-19 on the Chinese Canadian communities in different aspects and how we respond to them in our resilience ways. So today we are very excited to have our very distinguished panel to discuss with us and explore the impact on small businesses and strategies related to economic recovery. So um, before we welcome uh, them, we would like to, first of all, um, acknowledge that we are settlers on our land and we wanted to do a land acknowledgement. But before we do that, we actually would like to find out who are attending and participating in our webinar. So if you don't mind, please fill out a very brief uh, demographic survey. So we are posting that in the poll now. Please take a moment to do that. Okay, so about half of the people have responded. We give people a little bit of more time. So this way we can uh, have a better idea of... Okay, so while we were doing that, we can start with our land acknowledgement. Uh, Rain, would you like to do that, please? Hi, everyone. So my name is Rain. I'm one of the staff here at Protect. So uh, before we begin, we want to acknowledge this land uh, with gratitude and respect. Uh, we at Protect here honor and acknowledge that we are gathered on this sacred land covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. Toronto is located on a District 1 Spoon territory, which is a treaty between the Anishwabe Mississaugas and Haudenosaunee, but bounds them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and all the newcomers were invited into this treaty into this, in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect to share and care for the resources on this land. We are aware of the ongoing impact of colonialism, racism, and other forms of discrimination and social injustices that disproportion, disproportionately impacts Indigenous people, um, as well as uh, other racialized uh, communities here on Turtle Island, aka North America. We stand in solidarity to continue our fight against anti-Indigenous, anti-Black, anti-Asian, Islamophobia, and any other fo other forms of racism and social oppressions locally as well as globally. Thank you, Rain. So we have the Chinese version of our land acknowledgement. And so now we wanted to welcome our special guests for tonight. Uh, we have three um, members of the Chinese Canadian business community who have years of experience and have done a great deal of uh, work with the Chinese Canadian community. So we're very happy and honored to have Lucia Huang, Tony Louis, and George Leung with us. So um, we would like to maybe give you a moment. Can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Maybe start with uh, Lucia. Hey everyone, my name is Lucia. I'm the project and event uh, manager at Chinatown BIA. Um, I've been with Chinatown BIA for about four years and um, I myself moved to Toronto around six years ago. Um, I'm learning every day with the community and I'm very glad that I can work with the community and help the community, especially during the COVID. Thank you, Lucia. Tony? Uh, my name is Tony Louie, and I'm currently the uh, chair of the Toronto Chinatown BIA. Uh, this is actually my second term as chair of the BIA in uh, Chinatown. Uh, I came here as a young kid at 10 years old and uh, studied uh, uh, in North Toronto and basically grew up in North Toronto. In the old days, North Toronto was like Young and Lawrence. And I uh, went to U of T and uh, graduated business and uh, degree, but Bachelor of Commerce. 
And currently I'm a real estate broker uh, for quite some time, about 30 years plus, and also owner of Grossman's Tavern, Home of the Blues. And we play live music every night for the last 46 years in Toronto, starting with our previous owner of Grossman Tavern. The family actually bought Grossman Tavern back in 1975. So I basically grew up with the Chinese community. I was involved in many uh, events in Chinatown, uh, particularly uh, the land rezoning of Spadina Avenue back in 1997, in which I brought forward an appeal to the OMB, in which uh, I successfully managed to persuade the, the judge to side with me in terms of higher density and higher uh, heights limits for Spadina and Dundas area. And uh, currently I'm sort of like semi-retired and uh, kind of take it easy. And I believe that uh, good health and happiness is the most important thing for all of us. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tony. And last but not least, George. Hello, everyone. My name is George Leong. Professionally, I have been a banker throughout my career. After some 41 years, I recently retired in December. After moving to Toronto in 1979, my community involvement actually started after the protest against W5, if you remember that incident. Uh, I was a board member of Chinese Canadian National Council, CCNC, and a founding member and volunteer of Asian Community AIDS Services, ACAS. And most recently, I was a member on the Family Council of Seniors Health Center, a long-term care facility where my late mother spent her last seven years before passing. So I am very passionate about elders care. And during this COVID, it sort of brings forth a lot of challenges in, in this uh, segment of population. So uh, I intend to, uh, to do a lot about that. Thank you. So uh, we can see that we have a very experienced uh, energetic panel. Um, so we're gonna have a few scenarios that reflect the lived experience of the uh, Chinese Canadian business community uh, in response to the COVID pandemic. But before we start our case discussion, maybe we can just quickly review our webinars adequate. Uh, can you show the slide about our... Guidelines. So basically, in order to ensure that we have a safe and constructive space for, you know, dialogues and discussion, we wanted to ensure that we won't be tolerating any online harassments of any kind. And we're going to respect our uh, diverse opinion, but also make sure that, um, you know, different forms of oppressions and isms would not be tolerated. Um, we would request that you um, use the chat or the hand raising sign to express your wish to comment and speak. And you're very encouraged and welcome to uh, put in your ideas and questions through the chat and uh, question and answer um, mode and also use the raise hand signal and then we would invite you to speak uh, after our speakers has presented the scenarios. So thank you very much and we'll get started with our first scenario that uh, Lucia has uh, brought up. So maybe we can show that slide when Lucia presents the case of Mary. Thank you. Um, so our case scenario um, is mostly from our experience interact with our members, which is um, all the members in Chinatown, um, all the business owners in Chinatown. So uh, we are um, sharing the scenario so um, hope people can kind of understand the situation in Chinatown and what the business owners are facing and what's, what do you think as a business owner you can do during especially COVID. Um, so the first scenario is uh, Mary. Mary ran her, um, runs her business, retail business for 20 years. Most of her customers know about her business through word of mouth or walk in. Her store is not part of the essential service uh, the province announced. So she cannot really run the store uh, during uh, the lockdown, sorry, not store, store during the lockdown. So we have a uh, next slide for uh, two questions. We want people, um, the participant to think about uh, as a business owner, what would you do? So the first question um, is, Mary saw her neighbors are doing curbside pickup. So she started to 
put a table at the storefront for people to buy things from her. But she's very busy running back and forth to show people um, what the product she has. Um, so what, what do you think that she can do um, to, to improve this situation? So our first option is um, you can hire more staff, um, but hiring more staff meaning more um, expense. Um, so she might not be able to afford it. The second one is um, show people her products on the device, but a lot of business owners, they are older generations. They might not be able to um, using a device uh, smoothly. Um, the third option is printing all the products on the paper. However, if you want to show the product, you have to have the photos. Um, she might not have any photos for her, all her products and um, she might not know how to use the computer. Um, if you have any suggestions, what Mary might be able to do, um, you're more than welcome to um, type it in the chat. So yeah, you can choose more than one options and you can also put in your suggestions. So the more idea, the better, because we wanted to explore ways that we could help our businesses, right? So please take a moment to complete the poll. You can also put your suggestion in the chat box so that we can gather more strategies to help Mary. So Lucia, you wanna go on with the second question? Oh, um, are we going one by one? Cause I can talk about like each Just option. Yeah, so you could do the second question and then we can review the discuss okay. topic, please. Um, so the second question is, um, since she's selling at the store by putting a table in front of the store, a bylaw officer came and remind Mary that during the state of emergency, which is we are um, in Toronto right now, curbside purchasing shouldn't be happening. She can only uh, pre-sell and have the customer to only pick up the items. Um, so Mary's daughter say she can start an online store. Um, to start an online store, how can she do, do it? And the first one is hire someone again to start an online store. Um, but then cost can be crazy because the person will coordinate all the um, materials for the online store and establish in an online store. The second option is ask her daughter to start to study online store where, when she has free time. But the process might be slow because um, the daughter may not have experience to start an online store or doesn't know how to do it. So she needs to start from scratch. Um, the third option, which is some of our business are doing right now is just closing the store. And um, in this case, the person, uh, Mary, uh, sorry, Mary will have no income and she's not sure how long it can be for the emergency, uh, the state of emergency. And the last one is if you have a suggestion, uh, please feel free to share. Mm. Yeah, so we will give you a moment to add your suggestion and ideas. And again, you can choose more than one and then we will discuss that in a minute. Mm. Great. So, um, yeah, so we can maybe discuss some of the responses and the case. So in the chat, we saw some suggestions about obviously going online was one of the suggestion. And then the other suggestion was about finding out if there are other small businesses exploring the same ideas and to see whether there are community agencies that can support, uh, provide support, uh, including online support. So um, from your experiences, what can happen, Lucia? 
Um, so for online business, um, we had actually a survey um, during the summertime. We had a summer student, Stella. She helped us to go door to door to collect all um, uh, to collect surveys with our questionnaires um, to understand how our business are doing and what do they have. And our survey actually indicate um, we uh, so forty sorry fifty four percent of our business indicate that they do not use any uh, social media platform for marketing purpose. Um, so this survey we shared to four hundred and seven um, business, and we got uh, one hundred and eighteen surveys collected. Um, so. Um, a lot of business they won't be they they couldn't answer our survey because they are they are too busy or the survey might be too long. Um, so this is just part of our business um, answering the survey, and we think the situation might not be uh, as good as we we got. So fifty four percent of business they indicate that they do not even use any social media platform, and we have only thirty percent of business they have a public website. <clears throat> So um, for our business, we think that they, they are not familiar with the, the platform. And one situation is a lot of them, they are very old business, running a business. <clears throat> um, so for them, even have access to a computer is not easy, sorry. So having a computer um, for them, it's not even easy because even their accounting is by pen and paper. And they spend a lot of time doing that because they don't have a computer to save some of their time. Um, so that's one of the things we found that um, our business are having. Um, so we, we actually work with two summer students um, during um, COVID especially. Um, so we got a grant from Ontario government. We hired two students to go door to door to help our business to establish their online business. But again, our, our student found it is really difficult for them to start any online business because go back to like, the, because they don't have even a device and they, their business are not steady, especially during COVID. So they sometimes, they hesitate. They are not sure if, if it's really worth it to even in, invest in online presence. And they don't know the return because you are competing with a lot of other people. They might have a better strategy um, to run the online business. Um, so that's what we found. So we, we have the students who uh, go door to door um, to kind of provide the business a little bit background of what's online business, what's what's even just online presence. Um, so our student actually successfully um, helped business um, to just create the Google My Business profile um, to at least have something that people can search on to know, oh, are you still operating? What kind of dishes you're providing right now? What kind of product you're providing right, right now? And they also help 28 business to do a 360 Google um, uh, photo take, taking. Um, so if you go to some of the uh, Google My Business, you can see a 360 view of the store. So people can understand what they what's, what the products they might have even in our business. For example, um, we took photo for tap phone and uh, we, we took maybe more than 10 photos for tap phone. Um, so people can actually just go on Google My Business to just uh, like scroll around to understand what they are providing and they can just order from them by phone. So it, it saves a lot of people's time by some very easy way. Um, we also help uh, business um, that there is a very important um, brand that provided by Ontario government. Uh, we helped 16 business. It should be more than that um, to submit the application and got the digital transform transformation grant. It's a 2,500 grant that helped the business to purchase some basic things. For example, um, just a device for them to start online business or um, uh, an online store uh, with a photographer coming into the business to take photos for them. 
Um, so that's what we are providing to the business. And maybe Tony can talk about, um, he, he's using this uh, grant as well. Well, uh, we are in the business of live music. So uh, traditionally people come to a main street like Spadina Avenue, it's all traffic, pedestrian traffic and uh, word of mouth advertising. So this COVID has turned the world upside down on a lot of old timers. So they basically gone to no business to very little business or very little business to no business. So they basically have to change the business model. In order to change it, they must know how to do it. And as you know, uh, going back to my childhood experience when I learned to drive, uh, I still remember this very clearly from my driving instructor. He said, start the car. So the guy said, what? Start the car? How do I start the car? Put the car in ignition. But, but if you have never seen how you start a car, you wouldn't know it. So basically what we need to do is to provide today the e-commerce or the platform to go digital on, on the basis of having the know-how to show how and the pony show. Otherwise, for a lot of people, including myself, how do you make this thing work? How do you connect my camera to the audio or video interface? How do I put this uh, uh, project together in such a way that I could advertise? Is it Facebook? Is it Instagram? Uh, what is it? So for a lot of people, it's, it's very difficult. It's for people who are in the know, it's very simple. Young kids could do it all. But for anyone who is not that young, especially a lot of the operators in Chinatown, it is very, very difficult. And because when they have this sense of fear, how to adapt to a new technology and changing the business model. For example, how do you turn a restaurant sitting in with all the right uh, ambience, uh, lighting and service to all of a sudden packaging food in a, in a container and having to call Uber or someone to deliver the goods. That alone is a challenge. Uh, you know, it's not easy because uh, a lot of the food is not suitable for restaurant takeout. Uh, if we have fine dining, it's impossible to cook something nice and put it in a box. It's going to taste good half an hour later. So, and also in order to change from one model to the next, you don't know how long that model is going to last. We have businesses that converted their dining room into an entire takeout operation. If things ever get back to normal again, I don't know whether he's going to have enough takeout business to keep his shop strictly takeout. He might rely on some pedestrian traffic that's trying to find some room to sit at the restaurant and changes the whole buying behavior. So we don't know. The future is unpredictable and God knows how long this is going to last. And, and this is the real problem for a lot of people. And for a lot of older business owner, they may be contemplating of closing a dam. We have some bakery, we have some store that closed down because they had enough. You know, it's just not worth it even to try. If it wasn't for the government support in rent, uh, rent subsidy and wage subsidy, I, I think more than 80% of the business will close down. Because right now they're only paying like 10% of the rent and, and even property owners is getting some support in terms of insurance compensation, uh, utilities, and public tax relief. So mm -hmm. all of these things is enable the small main street businesses to survive. And I don't know how much longer, but we're certainly gonna try to put everybody on a digital basis. And mm -hmm. I think with or without COVID, this is the wave of the future. And in fact, you know, internet has been around like 30 years. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we're way too slow and it takes a virus to, to motivate people to change it to a new platform to suit their business. So, uh, yeah, so uh, I guess you're seeing some silver lining in that helping to move forward. George, would you like to add uh, any comments to this scenario? Yeah, um, listening to Lucia and, and Tony, uh, what I'd like to start with is to quickly recapitulate, um, you know, the current uh, situation. We are in extraordinary times. And in fact, you know, a lot of the questions that brought forth by this COVID, uh, we have yet to have any definitive answers. But business has to be run, bills have to be paid, and uh, employees 
have to find work. So as a business owner, what I like to, to do is to take you through like um, the two um, polling questions. To me, um, it would appear to be uh, the how, how to respond you know, to the changes all of a sudden. But uh, let's take a step back. You know, um, what exactly is your business model before the COVID? There are certain businesses that is cater very nicely uh, to deal with um, uh, the, uh, the physical distancing and lockdown, such as if you already operate a fast food business, you probably won't see much of a transition. And in fact, your business will be booming. But if you are running a banquet hall, then how are you going to cope with this change? Like Tony say, there are certain business models that one need to be well aware of before the COVID. And how are you going to foresee if this COVID lockdown is temporary, then it's fine. Everything will go back to the normal, the original business model. But what if this is going to be the new normal? Then one has to take a deep look at your the, the, the inherent business model that you set up your business with and the change of external environment uh, that is beyond our control. And I think, you, you know, the, these are some hard questions each business owner would need to go through. And I, I'm afraid uh, the panel uh, don't have any definitive answers for any one of you, you know, at this point. So maybe we can uh, move on to the next case, which is kind of related. Uh, so Lucia or uh, Tony, you're gonna talk about John? I can talk about it and uh, Tony can make comments on that. Um, so for scenario two, um, it's John. He has a 40 years restaurant that is famous for the experience with the food and atmosphere. For example, um, the restaurant has a live performance in the um, in, inside. After the pandemic, he his dying business dropped significantly to only 20% in 2020. And most of the time, no one is allowed to dine in in the restaurant. Um, John is in his retirement age and he, his kids has no plan uh, to take over the business. So in this situation, um, to increase the sales, what can John do? Uh, a, John can deliver, can do the delivery service, but the food is hard to deliver and keep the same experience. I saw people um, saying that he, she, or uh, someone order ramen, it's not the same anymore. It's some cases for some business for sure. It's the experience just better when you have the food in the restaurant. The second one is to start uh, develop a, a different way to deliver his food, but then he might need a different to invest different type of equipment. For example, um, frozen food, you, you need uh, equipment to, to froze the food. Uh, the last one is your suggestion. So you can see that in the poll and your suggestion is very much uh, encouraged and important to add to our ideas. So please be generous and uh, share with us your thoughts. We take a moment. Think about like how, how the business can recreate the atmosphere they have um, in, in the business. For example, if you used to have live performance, how the business can create the same experience and situation for people to deliver the food. Mm -hmm. That's what Tony was talking about just now, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I see people actually responding to the poll now. We give them a little bit more time. And you can also type in your comments in the chat. So in the previous case, people do bring up the digital uh, grants and stuff, but I know that the BIA is already on it and, you know, has yeah, so, so that. So if, if you don't mind, um, so we, we do deliver the digital grants and we found, um, although government are providing the grants, our business are actually telling us that it's hard for them to, to understand all the grants. Because mm -hmm. of them delivered in English, uh, we we usually kind of translate a little bit for the business to understand the idea of the grant. But mm -hmm. the business still need to apply everything by themselves, and 
if this is a challenge for them already. Definitely. Yeah, so the access to uh, public support and public resources is always a challenge. And uh, yeah, so while we continue the poll, yeah, yeah, so I think it's really important to recognize that even when there is resources, the access to them is not equal, right? For different communities with different language barriers and awareness of these access. And so what we are doing is we we deliver um, newsletter in bilingual. We always deliver the latest information from the government in uh, Chinese and English. So we make sure our business can at least have, have some resources to understand what's the latest um, program that provided by the government. So what are some of the ways that you and the community has responded to John's scenario. Tony, you wanna to start commenting? Well, <clears throat> basically we are looking at changing of the business model. One from reliance on traditional word of mouth advertising, uh, having the food traffic, uh, bringing the customer into your business premises. Now we have to bring our goods and services to the people. So it's, it's instead of one way, it's going the other way. So basically what it, means is that you have to generate a lot more business because you are now have to target your customers. You have to find a way to find where your customers are. So you have to reach out to them. And the cheapest and the easiest way to do so would be on the digital basis, okay? And also because it is now on, on the digital basis or computerized, it enable one to have a turnkey operation a lot more than the traditional method. So things become more automatic, things become more systematic, uh, more mechanicalized. Uh, everything is gonna gear towards simple dummy operation. So there'll be a lot less personal interaction because of the physical distancing, but we don't know how long this is gonna last. But in any case, it enabled the business operator to re-examine his relevance in the marketplace that should he or should not continue to operate in the old fashioned way, or maybe something better can be a uh, result from this COVID-19 uh, situation. So I think it's, it's good and bad in some way, it, it sort of encouraged people to continue and sort of quietly telling other operators, perhaps you should take an early retirement. And I think uh, we have to examine why we are doing the business the way we are doing it. That's it. Mm. So there are some comments, maybe I can read it out and Lucia and uh, George, you can also comment on it. So uh, one is about exploring a creative way to attract special specific population, like partnering with student, uh, with student support and cut down on the number of dishes, but make sure the dishes are more creative and get young people to help create uh, marketing ideas or join other delivery services and work on packaging and other details to make it more interesting. And prepare semi-prepared food and customers can finish cooking and heating them up at home. So it'd be, I guess, fresher and uh, that will do well for delivery. And so what, and I create a YouTube channel to do a food show and get people to want your food. Wow. Uh, and more organic choices and innovative vegetarian choices to start trends. You see, if we look back at uh, Main Street commercial at one time, it was got sent. When you open a store or a restaurant, you get people keep coming in. It's nonstop all day. I mean, to a certain extent, a lot of the operators were spoiled because they didn't have to do anything. All you had to do is open the door and Business come right in. That's back in the 60s and 70s and 80s. I mean, people excited to come to the main street, but time has changed. The paradigm has shifted to one of e-commerce, one of staying home. People don't want to go out uh, and compounded with the idea that people now works from home. Look at all these restaurants downtown. They're going to be so big, uh, empty because kids are working from home. My son works from home for a year and a half already. So, so you know, all these people that stay home and work, it's gonna cut down a lot of the demand for uh, dining out, uh, retail shopping, 
services, like surveying your phone. So it's a real change in our lifestyle. So we must take a hold of that. Mm -hmm. Lucia, you have anything to add? Um, so I, I saw some people um, yeah. commenting that uh, they think the business can make some changes to their current menu. Uh, we actually had one business is doing that right now and they just got on Blockio, so it's a huge uh, thing for them. So it's in Dao restaurant. They, when I went in, I'm like, oh, your menu is different. And some of Phyton are actually more expensive. And they say, yeah, because they want to accommodate what people are, what people's need right now. A lot of items might not taste as good when they go home. Or uh, some, some items might be easy to share with the whole family. So they make a bigger portion. Uh, the, if it's just people who live alone, they can eat it for a couple meals. Um, so we have business are doing that. But again, like, uh, like Tony said, the business model is very different. So uh, for in Dao, they have uh, the couple, the younger couple, um, the second generation taking over the business. They, they have been using a couple months. They actually closed for a couple months to, to develop a new uh, menu. So the changes can be done, um, but it really depends on the resources that the business have. And we do our part by promoting them. So we have been doing uh, promotion videos for each business. We try to go in and have the business owner to talk about their story. And we also tried a innovation um, project called 4D Chinatown. We uh, hire a, a 360 camera and we use like a storytelling uh, method to, to introduce each of our business. Um, so people, they will have like a feeling of they are still in the business. So we all want to go out. Um, so this is a great platform for them to kind of experience um, their, their, their time when business are still operating. And I think they, there are still demands. Um, it's just up to the business if they can catch the demands and how they are changing their business model to adopt the demands. Mm -hmm. Actually, that was something that I wanted to do back in 2014 when I was the chair of the BIA the first time around. And uh, in fact, that's absolutely incredibly interesting because we can bring our services and the goods to the family uh, in the living room, as opposed to uh, having them come down and discover there's nothing to see. So we have to make sure that we will let people know what's there in Chinatown that's worth their while to come down. And mm -hmm. that's what I wanted to do back in 2014. But we didn't have the resources, we didn't have the staff, we didn't have the, the know-how. And now we do have the know-how and the show-how, and now we're gonna show people the ponies too, the pony show, how to do it. So thank you. George, you have anything to add? Uh, yes. Um, when we talk about uh, making changes to our business, now the business exists for a reason, because to, uh, we provide certain goods and services to the customer which we appreciate, uh, they appreciate you know, what we offer. So it brings me back to the fundamentals of marketing 101 that I, that I um, uh, learned in university is the 4P of marketing. First of all, let's re-examine, this is soul searching. If you want to make any changes, what exactly is the new product and services you, you are contemplating? Uh, the second P is the people. Who is your new target market? Where are they? And, and how do you describe their demographics? The pricing point, and also the method or uh, the channel of promotion. Um, the, the communication channel in 21st century certainly you know, is different from uh, where we started in the 70s. So uh, the fundamentals of the 4P you know, still is relevant if uh, you are an entrepreneur and you are contemplating making changes to your existing business model. Right? This is what I'd like to uh, share with the participants. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. So, yeah, so we-, we... A good thing um, for, cause there's a comment about the collective um, do the delivery. Um, I, I just want to mention a little bit about the delivery. For, for our business, they're, they're having like smaller uh, profit margins. So for them, the more delivery they're doing, it's actually not sometimes not good enough for their business um, because the the Uber they, they charge 30% of commission. And our 
like a bowl of noodle it's probably eight dollars to eleven dollars um and you have to consider the labor you have to consider the cost of the food sometimes it's not even worth it for the business to do a lot of delivery with the bigger platforms um so we appreciate some of the chinese platform they're offering a, a lower um uh, commission and uh, the province just announced they want to have a cap on uh, the deliver commission for uh, big companies like Uber. Sorry. The marginal cost is greater than the marginal revenue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what money you make, the more you sell, the more you lose. Mm. Yeah, so there's many uh, different dimensions to the different ideas. I think they are worth exploring, but uh, you know, I think we need to consider the different context as well, right? And even with the digital platform, I, I was thinking that, you know, a lot of uh, places have website too, but you do need people to maintain it and also to respond to orders and stuff, right? So it's not just having that one time set up. Yeah. So yeah, um, that's a good point that we have um, business. They, they hesitate to start the online, even just Google my business. Because once you have negative comment, if you don't reply to that, it's, for people, they will just see the negative part. So I kind of agree that for business, they, they never been to this digital field. It's, it's scary because you don't know what, gonna, what people are going to say about you online. And you, because of the limit um, knowledge of online business, you probably won't see that. Um, so for them, it's, it's really an unknown field for, for business mm -hmm. owners. Yeah, so I think our third case is going to build on this two case. But before we move there, maybe I can check with the, all the participants one thing. So uh, we realized that it seems that everybody's been sending the comments to the panelist only. But actually, if you pull down on your chat uh, options, there is a second option put on the pull down menu that says panelist and attendee. So if you want everyone to see your comment, please check if you can pull it down to the panelists and attendees when you send your comments, and this way everybody should be able to see your comments. So uh, if people cannot do that, let us know and then we'll check our setting, but uh, you should be able to send that. So should we go on the third case? George, would you like to take us through the third case? Sure. Um... You, you will see the bullet points uh, on the screen, but I want to give you a little bit more background about Mr. Yong. You know, um, uh, he was my, my uh, longtime customer uh, operating a retail wholesale business in Chinatown. Now he used to work for somebody, but always wanted to be his own boss. So as a free spirit entrepreneur, he quickly found a market niche and started his own company and the business flourished in the next few years. And he now has a team of 10 employees working for him. So I once asked Mr. Young, what keeps you up at night? And you know what he told me? He said, my worst fear is failing the business as there are 10 families counting on me for their financial well-being. If for whatever reason I cannot pay the bills or salaries, their families will suffer because of me. This is what keeps me up at night all the time. So you, as you can see, it's not easy to be an entrepreneur and I get it. Owning um, uh, one's business is not just about the owner uh, himself or herself, but also those who are directly and indirectly involved in the business. And uh, I get it from Mr. Young that during this uh, uh, COVID pandemic is really, uh, giving him so much undue pressure to keep his business afloat. Um, I've been keeping in touch with him and ask him um, how, he, uh, how his business is doing. Now, I'm concerned about Mr. Young's business uh, uh, during this extraordinary times, uh, being in the heart of Chinatown, his business is counting on the endless stream of tourists uh, who are drawn to Chinatown. And given the current environment, uh, the fiscal distancing and crowd control, which is a detrimental blow to a key success factor of his business, being situated in Chinatown. And uh, he told me his uh, retail business has seen uh, a drastic reduction uh, since the, prov uh, the province-wide lockdown um, is down 60% year over year. And the wholesale 
uh, a side of business which mainly catered to restaurants and uh, businesses in the hospitality trade has suffered even a bigger blow, a drastic 75% drop in income. So meanwhile, he's, um, he's leasing a 5,000 square feet premises, including warehouse, and it's a huge financial burden. So um, he has a lot of challenges, you know, on his hand. Mm -hmm. So what do you think are some of the options? Or do we have a poll? Can we post that and continue that discussion? Yep, so um, the first question uh, we would like to elicit your, your input is, uh, uh, if you were Mr. Young, what would you do to reduce the mental stress in dealing with the challenges? Um, have an open dialogue with his employees, discuss his personal and financial situation with a financial planner or coach or some professionals, uh, check out community mental health resources, getting small business related resources from government and business association sites, uh, including the, uh, the financial relief program that is currently offered by uh, banks and the government, uh, try meditation or any other actions that uh, you have in mind. Maybe uh, we could go for the second question as well, just because uh, the poll is together. Sure. So the second question, uh, and then again, if you were Mr. Yong, how would you plan for future of your business in Chinatown that has been heavily impacted? Um, the answers could be uh, investing in new technology, joining group efforts to revitalize Chinatown business, hire and train employees to adapt to new business environment, change the shop layouts or finding new business locations or any other actions that you have in mind. And again, you can select multiple answers, right? And again, we invite you to be generous and innovative in your thinking and contribute to the ideas and put in your ideas in the chat. And if you want everyone to see, pull down on the chat and set, send your comments to panelists and attendees. So we're seeing quite a bit of comments, so we'll give people a little bit more time. So, uh, George, you can see the comments, right? Uh, not yet. No? In the panel, nope. the comments, the chat box, the chat. Asking the chat. You can see the comments in the chat box, but can you see the poll results too? Oh, okay. But you can see some of the comments in the chat box. So reduce retail shop areas, appeal to the Chinese community to see that as a collective issues. Okay, I see some of them. Yeah, so now we've closed the poll, then you can see the response. And then the comments. Ah, I got it. Yeah, okay. Have an open dialogue with its employees, discuss his personal. So I guess Chinatown. everyone choose most of the responses are quite viable. Yep, yeah, 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 right. And then the comments also said try to revitalize Chinatown, not only specific to business, but link it to broader identity, heritage, and history. Yeah, this is a really good point I want to share with uh, other panelists as well. Um, people set up a business in Chinatown for a specific reason, right? 
And uh, Chinatown as a business community is a reflection of a much larger community. But businesses that operate within Chinatown could be very specific and uh, that tie to, you know, the character of uh, Chinatown. Now, I uh, sort of broadly categorize it uh, as a tourist attraction, a place where people will take their family, um, uh, uh, take a trip over the weekend and have a fun time there. So this is a very specific characteristic of Chinatown that attract the business to start up there and the people who go there and enjoy the goods and services. So this, this is a much larger um, issue and uh, uh, to revitalize Chinatown. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, BIA is doing a lot of work on that uh, already, right? So Lucia or Tony, you want to share some of the initiative that has well, been done? As you know, Chinatown depends on 40% uh, of the business coming from uh, the tourists. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I must say, when you have people coming into an area, now they're not coming into the area. So you have to change your business model. I mean, we're trying everything we can in terms of promoting everything digital, but that's, there's a limitation as to what you can do on, on a digital basis. Even food delivery or goods delivery, you have to be learning UPS, uh, FedEx and uh, Canada Post and freight is very expensive. We can sell t-shirts to people one by one or masks to people, but the, the, the postage is very, very expensive. It could be half of what you cost in terms of merchandising. So uh, it's not the easy task to, to, to be vitalized until we get people back into the store. That's what pedestrian Main Street is all about. We need walking traffic. And, uh, you know, we got to somewhat blend the two together, digital as well as local traffic, and that's badly needed. And so we cannot abandon one or just go to the other. We have to work on both aspects of bringing people to Chinatown. Yeah. Well, maybe the new normal is the combination of both. That's uh, right. Uh, look at uh, Art Gallery of Ontario, you know, Royal Ontario Museum. Um, if they don't have the actual, you know, patrons walk through the aisles and look at, uh, you, you know, the art pieces, you know, what do they do now? They do virtual, you, you, you know, like uh, Van Gogh, you, you know, exhibit, you, you know, it, it looks, you know, very successful. So I'm just imagine, you know, what Chinatown is that can bring forth, you, you know, um, the theme of Chinatown and create some sort of a virtual interest to attract people's attention and then sell goods and servers, you, you know, um, as part of it. But it, it's just a thought that I, I want to throw out to you, you know, for, for discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think they, they have a good point that you have to think about the function of Chinatown. Uh, many years ago, it might be because Chinatown is the place for people to seek um, help, services, um, food mm -hmm. from, from right. their hometown. Um, today might be a little bit different. Um, we, we have, and we have different demographic as well. We, we have more maybe um, Asian student, Chinese student coming into the area. So some of our business are benefiting from uh, international student from UFT and they may have maybe some of them have a better um, ability to, to shop and dine. So you can see some of our business are providing a more higher end or expensive products because the demographic are different. We have a, a r and restaurant. They are providing a high end uh, Chinese food. Um, so things like that. I think Chinatown is transforming um, slowly as well at the same time because the situation has been um, changing as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a few minutes left. So uh, I would invite any of our participants if you want to make comments or ask the panelists questions, please uh, raise your hand and then we'll uh, unmute you to speak. And we see that uh, one of the comments is that we need our Chinatown to provide something beyond just goods and services. We can engage people in doing fun things for people to do, to learn and to connect. So I guess that ties into what Tony was saying about like the whole walking community 
idea, right? So, um, yeah, so I think is there some um, kind of a government policy or like um, rezoning kind of things that might help, you know, revisioning some of the Chinatown structure, do you think? To make it like a more walking and, and facilitate that walking traffic and uh, I think we have to start from a uh, uh, area development plan. We have to start from drawing board to uh, mm -hmm. redesign everything from the ground up. And that requires a lot of time and expertise. And, you know, it's, it's another level. It's another level of development that I think is absolutely critical to the future development of Chinatown. And that is actually on our plate too. But because of COVID-19, uh, we kind of lost a year's time. Mm -hmm. So I guess the other question I want to maybe throw out to you and also the audience to think about is, I know that we are all like, you're all part of the business community, right? But as a general public, as a general citizen and a member of the Chinese Canadian community, what do you think that the average person can do to contribute to supporting our businesses? Right, because like in the early days we said like, oh, people try to order as much takeout from restaurants as possible. But as you, your cases illustrate, it's much broader than that, right? There's many more dimensions to that. It's not everybody, uh, you know, facing the same issues. So, what are some of the ways you think that as a general citizen we can contribute to support and help our businesses? Shop in person and shop online. That's it. Well, I'm thinking. Um, I myself is also a a patron and consumer of uh, goods and services. And I think everyone can do their part is by providing feedback, like have an open dialogue, you know, with uh, 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 the service providers, tell them what would you like to see the changes and um, help them to determine um, the new way of doing things, the new business model that will cater to the changing times. Lucia? Um, I think myself, I, I really love to explore and learn the story. Um, so I think you, everyone should spend a little bit, bit time to understand the community, understand yourself, understand your role for the community. Um, I, I kept telling my friend before I work in Chinatown, I, I don't know much about this community and I have maybe some of the negative um, impression of the community. But after I work here, I learned so many wonderful stories from, from our business owners. Um, they tell me, oh, we, we started to, to do the dumpling business and we got so famous. Um, uh, we have pizza joint. They, they joined our, our community. They are very young and they are doing some uh, very special flavor pizza and I, I love them. So after you know the community, after, after you have the conversation, the dialogue with the community, with, with the business owner, you'll find the charm um, of the community. And, and again, I feel like if you can afford it, I know not everyone can do that, but if you can afford it, support the community by buying things from independent business and local. Um, I try to dine, even I, I, I can cook at home. I try to um, dine, uh, buy things, uh, delivery to my office every time when I work downtown. Um, I try to, instead of buying things from Amazon, I try to buy from our ind independent business. Um, I think this is important to just support them. My friends, some of them like, why do you spend so much time just to search on the store that you can purchase from? But that's what I can do as a citizen to, to support the business and let them know their assistance is important to me. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess the other question I have, is there, is there any partnership between the business community and, and besides BIA, like with other community service uh, volunteer agencies so they can pull in maybe more young people say like to help with the digital work and the marketing in the longer term? Because I think like Chinatown also has a very rich community services, right? We have a lot of uh, um, beauty and then traditionally they are supporting, you know, settlement and other social services. But um, has there been some collaboration with the business community through the pandemic? Um, we, we work with different organizations. Um, 
um, if, if they have someone that need help, we can kind of cross promote and help the service with uh, provide a service. Um, I, I don't have a specific name for um, uh, organization, but we, we keep collaborating even with the UFT students. And that's why we hire summer students because they, they have this energy and, and knowledge to help our community. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I see in a comment that Chuck put in, the Chinatown BIA has been collaborating with different community organizations to work on community development and doing fun things such as uh, lantern making workshops. Uh, there's a lantern making workshop coming very soon, partnering with STEPS, which is a public art organization. That sounds very interesting. Yeah, thank yeah. you. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. so I think that's, that's actually like a really Good point, right? Because I think that if we can even broaden that connection, that people see that we are all interconnected in different ways. It's not just, you know, we are both uh, contributing to the economy, to the services, to the community in different ways. And as you know, like we can all learn about the stories and the histories of our community. And, and I think the reason why we had Chinatown to begin with is because of a lot of the discrimination that the earlier uh, immigrants who build the real world faces after we finished building the Canadian real world. So, you know, um, now it's a tourist attraction, but there's the history is really to protect ourselves and to build our own community to start with. So I think this is a really timely uh, call for learning more about our history and also, you know, building more collaborating partnerships. And I think that all um, you know, not just business people or, you know, finance people can contribute. I think all of us can try to help in different ways. So I'm really um, thankful that we have this opportunity. Maybe we can invite uh, you folks back and also might be, you know, other businesses and other uh, partners to have uh, even a more dynamic dialogue as we go into the, the more, um, the next phase that Tony talked about that, you know, we, you've been planning for a long time, which is the whole revisioning of Chinatown and building the new Chinatown, then we can engage in another exciting discussion about that. Yes, the overhaul Chinatown uh, under a comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. So we'd like to thank you all for your contribution, but before we end, if you can uh, quickly do our exit poll, which we'll post it now, and then while you're responding to that, we would like to uh, remind you of two of our upcoming events. So next week on our Community Partner Showcase, we would be featuring Avi Go, who is the director of the Chinese and Southeast Asian Legal Clinic, uh, to talk about the experiences um, amongst the surface users of the clinic and the issues that our community faces uh, during the pandemic. And then next Thursday, we have another exciting resiliency dialogue workshops. This time we would be focusing on issues faced by our younger generations in terms of how they deal with racism, discrimination, and how they respond to the pandemic in their resilience ways. So please uh, don't forget to join us next week. And if you can fill in the poll, that would be much appreciated. So thank you very much. And thanks again, uh, Lucia, Tony, and George for a very constructive and excited uh, discussion. And we hope that we can all work together to rebuild our community and make it as vibrant as ever and more so after the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, thank you and good night. Good night.